We are starting. We are starting in a new section. If you have your Bibles. I know I say that all the time. You should always have your Bibles. I can't believe the number of people that show up without their Bibles. Um, Exodus chapter three. And this will be the key verse for most of this next four lessons. Exodus chapter 3, and verse 6. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face. For he was afraid to look upon God. Amen. Amen. Dear Lord, I love you, Lord. I appreciate you. Thank you, Lord, for another opportunity, Lord, to gather together, to read through your word and to study, Lord. I pray that we speak to our hearts and our minds. Help us, Lord, to receive. Help us, Lord, to, to be more like you, Lord. I pray in Jesus' name. Grow closer to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The next series is on the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of your fathers. Now I could go through and there's a whole story concerning Moses. And we are very familiar with the story of Moses. And how Moses was separated at birth. Saved from the Pharaoh. Grew up in Pharaoh's house, and and one day left left the Pharaoh's house and went out to be amongst his people and saw one of the taskmasters abusing one of his people, and he killed him. Right. And then we read that portion um, a couple services ago. And he says, I didn't get the response I thought I was going to get. Right. So he ran. He ran to the desert. Amen. And this is where the story picks up. He ran to the desert. Hebrews 11.23 says, By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents, because they saw he was a proper child, and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. When the command went out from the king that every baby boy should be turned over to Pharaoh's guards to be cast into the river, Moses' mother, Jochebed, and his father, Amram, refused. As soldiers patrolled the streets, these God-fearing parents undertook the impossible task of keeping a newborn baby quiet. What care they must have taken with him, making sure he was never wet and hu never hungry. By faith, they hid him for three months. They were not afraid of the king. Why? Because faith trumps fear. Yeah. When they realized it was no longer possible to hide Moses away, Amram and Jochebed exhibited their even greater faith. Jochebed put Moses in the bulrush ark by faith. By faith, she carried him to the crocodile-infested waters of the Nile and let him float among the reeds. She left her little boy in God's hands. Faith means when we reach the end of human ability, we launch our hopes out on the deep and trust in God to keep them afloat. Amen. Amen. In both their determination to hold on and the willingness to let go of Amram and Jochebed displayed their faith in Jehovah. And they are mentioned among the heroes of faith in Hebrews 11. If we have a heritage of faith that is a blessing we should never take for granted. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Moses developed a faith of his own. Just like all of us, we need to develop our own faith. Right. It's great that you have parents of faith. Right. It's great that you have grandparents of faith. Right. 
But that doesn't automatically translate down to you and to I and to our children. Right. Amen. Amen. At some point, my responsibility—I'm responsible for myself. Right. Yeah. Amen. 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 And so there comes that moment, and we always call that the the age of accountability. Right. Mm -hmm. Amen. Nobody could ever put a finger on exactly what age that is. Right. Amen. I think when you're old enough to stand up and say, "But I'm my own person." Yeah. Okay. Let me go right ahead. Now you are responsible for your own faith. But I only eat. Well, don't claim independence when it's convenient for you. Right. Right. So Jacob is still her faith in Moses even while she nursed him. She and Amram taught him the faith of their fathers. They instilled in him that he was a Hebrew, not an Egyptian. Yet Moses eventually had to make the decision to have faith for himself. Now think about this. I We are not clear on what age he actually was put in the basket floated down the river. Have no idea. But I would like to think, or I, for some reason, I don't know why I think this, but maybe it's just the popular opinion. He, he was at the age where he didn't know who his parents even were. He was still an infant. Probably didn't even just probably just discovering his own toes and his own fingers. So the girl up in the Pharaoh's house must have been strange when it's his mother who's his nursemaid trying to tell him, I'm your mother. Shh, keep it secret. You're a Hebrew, not an Egyptian. So we, we think automatically he's going to grow up and go, hey, I'm different than these people are. I know exactly who I am. No. It had to have been taught. But when you're around negativity or, or, or opposing forces, especially even on a child who... The Pharaoh's daughter raised him as her son. Now you have two women. You have the Egyptian Pharaoh's daughter and his real mother, Jochebed, both saying, I'm your mother. We need, to, we need to really put this in the context. I mean, this wasn't a clear-cut case of, of identity. Okay? Right. So when when it comes time for Moses to to figure out where where he fell into place, they instilled in him that he was a Hebrew, not an Egyptian. So Hebrews eleven, twenty four through twenty six tells us by faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. So choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. So Moses made his parents' faith personal. So even after he was taken from their home and moved to the palace, and even when he was trained in all the knowledge, customs, and pagan lore of the Egyptians, amen. But as he stood at the burning bush, this is your first answer, Moses could only look back and see his past failures. We, we have some really good questions here this evening, so I hope you're geared up to do some thinking. So Moses sinned 
and then tried to cover it up. So Moses went out to visit his people. We already covered this. Moses killed the slave driver. Moses' action was not premeditated, organized insurrection, or bid for na nationwide freedom. It was an impetuous and furious murder. So then Moses fled into obscurity in Midian rather than face the king's wrath. Shame and a feeling of cowardice must have plagued Moses all those silent years in the wilderness. Moses' sister Miriam had once summoned the courage to speak to Pharaoh's daughter on his behalf, but Moses had fled and left Miriam and his brother Aaron behind. He had abandoned his family and his people to slavery, resigned himself to exile, self-appointed exile, and accepted the death of his dreams. Now, at what point can we start Can we start to relate to this? How many times have we had or we felt that we had a calling or a dream or a vision from God as to what God sees for us and then all of a sudden we just make a mistake and we think that all of a sudden that that puts an end to the vision and the call. And then we run our whole lives away from this one mistake. And that's exactly what Moses was doing. He was in the desert because of this one mistake. He was ready to cash in the dreams and the vision his mother was implanted in him. We're going to be focusing on that, so keep that in mind. So by the time he stood at the burning bush, Moses had all but forgotten his faith. No doubt, Moses was disillusioned by his, next answer, failures. See, we're going to have some good questions here tonight. So, a prince of Egypt does not spend 40 years herding sheep on the backside of the desert unless he has given up on himself and what he perceived to be his mission. The church is full of people who have given up on themselves. God can't use me. I've, I've, I've gone too far. There, there, there's no hope for me anymore. I've failed too many times. We need to comprehend one thing. There is no timing God doesn't have the same time frame we're in. He's not in the same time frame we are. The Bible said He knew us before we was even born. Well, that's impossible. How could He have known that? Well, unless He transcends time. Okay? So what am I trying to get us to understand? That calling was made to us even though He knew we were going to fail. Right. But He still called anyways. Yeah. He still has a plan anyways. He laid out a plan for each and every one of us even though He knew that we were going to fail. 
All of a sudden, failure jumps in with you. All that just disqualifies us. And God's like, what? I called you in spite of your failures. we do. So if I fail, that all man disqualifies me. God said, oh, I'm way up here. I'm way ahead of you. Amen. I also see that there, there's, this, there's this rule, this law of, you ever heard of it, called predestination. Mm-hmm. That our lives are predetermined. Yeah. And that God just He knows the end which this is true. But I also believe that God sees in two time frames. I like to believe that he does. He sees what really happens, and then he sees what could happen. Why? Human beings are fickle people. We just might absolutely surprise the socks off of him. Can we surprise him? No. But we can surprise ourselves. I'm not trying to get us to understand. No matter what time frame he sees it in, there's always, what I'm trying to get us to understand, is an opportunity for us to correct our path. It doesn't, it's not predetermined. If I start out a failure, just because I started out a failure, predetermination says I will always be a failure. But that's not how God works. We fail, he still calls, and maybe, just maybe, we might answer the call. And our steps are, and I, I, I love this, how, how people, you, you ever play the board game of life? Yeah. Roll the dice, you move this little car, you land on the spot. Oh, by the way, you just had twins. What? I just was married like two moves ago. How can I already have twins? And all of a sudden you got a station wagon full of kids. And you're moving across the board. And all of a sudden you find out that you're a newspaper guy. And you're making $20,000 a year. Car full of babies. Two cars full of babies. Two cars full of babies. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Two cars full of babies. You live in a you live in a trailer down by the river. Stop calling mom and dad out like this. Just keep popping them all. And you roll the dice, read the card, and oh no. Now they want to go to college. <laughs> Pay for college tuition? <laughs> I wish. And twenty thousand dollars? Where? Windfall! Yeah! Bankruptcy. <laughs> bankruptcy. Declare bankruptcy. This is how people think their lives are. Right. They're on a board, and God's just moving them around, and that, and that, and that that's how. All of a sudden, we step out of the will of God because we decide that, oh, we want to go get like that one spot. You want to go 10 spaces this direction or 10 spaces this direction. Now, if you couldn't look ahead, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Get double my income. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I get to lose my income in this direction. Mm-hmm. 
But let's say if you couldn't see what the end result was. And we have a tendency to think, well, if I make the wrong decision, I don't know what to do. We stand at the crossroads in our lives and we're, we're at the age of accountability is your crossroads. That's the point where I have to make the decision. Which way am I going to go? I am now accountable for myself. I can no longer hang on to the coattails of my family. I've now got to make a decision for myself. And what did Moses' decision do? Found him on the backside of the desert. Why? Because he thought he had moved himself out of God's plan. He took the wrong turn, counted out 10 spaces, and boom, landed on backside of the desert. You got a car full of kids, you're in the backside of the desert. Living in a trailer down by the river. Well, no, that'd be waterfront property. That'd be too expensive. No, but that'd be the flood zone. That, that's the property where people are paying you to take. So 40 years, 4 zero, he spent feeling miserable. Kicking himself. I could have I could have done this, I should have done that. Second guessing himself. And always thinking that one mistake or that mistake just all of a sudden moved him out. So now we got to understand that, that I'm, I'm hoping that that, that paints the context of where we're at. We, we read these people in the Bible and we say, oh, these are great people of faith. They didn't always start out that way. They were just normal people. Trying to figure out what God's plan is for their lives and where they fit in. We get to see the hindsight. So when we read about these, I like to put myself in their shoes when I'm studying or reading the Bible and I'm, I'm looking at these things. I'm, I'm trying to figure out what's going on in their head. It's easy to read and see what the outcome is and go, oh, okay. Oh. But think about it. When you're in that that immediate time frame and you're Moses. Right. <laughs> oh, those, that's, that, that's where I like to get. When I, when I like to get myself into trying to figure out, imagine what they're thinking. What would I be thinking if I was them? Right. And a lot of times, I'm, what would I have done different? Probably nothing. Why? Because we're geared to run from our mistakes. That's like instinct. We run from our problems. <coughs> Moses thought he was placing his faith in God, but he he had put far too much faith in himself. So Moses was seemingly forgotten for 40 years. Surely he felt forgotten, rejected and cast aside as a failure. We all go through similar desert times in our lives. And if I were to, nobody raise your hand, but if I were to ask people to raise their hand, they feel like that at times. I'm sure everybody at one time or another would raise their hand and say, yeah, at one time or another I felt like I was in a desert. But the desert has a peculiar way sometimes 
That is the only place and the only time God may be able to even get to us. Why? Because when you're in that desert place, you then finally just given up your will and said, you know what? I've done. Throw it in the towel. I've done all that I can do. You have already felt like a failure. And all of a sudden, then God starts to speak to you. Why? Because what happened? You no longer can you put faith in your own self. When I was younger, I could swim. I was a really good swimmer. I guess I probably still could. Because they say some things you just never forget. I, I had no problem swimming. I, I could swim all day. I, I, I could tread water. I could float. I could float on my back or my stomach all day long. Just sit there and float. But the moment I put my legs down and realize I can't touch bottom, I panic. As long as I thought I could touch bottom, I was fine. But when I found out I couldn't touch bottom, I panic. I've been swimming out over my head for hours. And they didn't even think anything of it. So I went to stand up and realized I couldn't touch bottom. It's the way we get. We get out over our heads. And all of a sudden when we realize we're all over our heads, we panic. Then that's when God says, okay, now that you finally... Now that you know that one mess up you could drown, now I can finally work with you because you finally put yourself out there. That's how a desert works. Sometimes we, we, we're in our self-imposed desert. But sometimes that's what it takes for God to get to us. And that's exactly what happened here. Moses... God was finally able to get to Moses while he was in the desert. And when the time was right, God did not have, a, a, have to scour the world to find Moses. No. He, imported, he pinpointed a bush right beside Moses and it burst into flames. So Moses could only look back at his forsaken faith and his deep failures. But God was looking ahead. We need to remember our past is our past. Tomorrow is a new day. Amen. Our past doesn't have to affect our tomorrow. Amen. But God was looking ahead. Why? We always look back. And he was looking ahead to Moses' future. God cast a fresh vision. I don't think it was a fresh vision. I think it was always the same vision. I uh, maybe shared the story. Maybe, maybe I have it. Maybe the individuals I have. But I don't think I have publicly at least. Um, when I was in Bible college, I asked, and we're laying around the room, so what do you think, what, what, do, you, what do you think is God's calling or vision for your life? Oh, 
And the most popular answer was, I'm still trying to figure out what God's will is for my life. Ah, it's always seemed to be popular. Why? Because nobody wanted to have the guts to stand up and say, I feel like. Well, when they got to me, I said, pastoring. Well, you're pretty sure about that. That was pretty quick. And I said, I said, don't misunderstand me. I said, I don't know what route I'm going to take to get there. That's all in God's hands. Yeah. But I do know the end result is that I'm going to be pastoring somewhere. It might take three years. It might take eight years. It might take 40 years. All I know is when all is said and done, I'm going to end up somewhere pastoring. Oh. So that might sound like Almost, you're going to cover the gambit. <laughs> well, if anybody's been in the ministry for any length of time, they, really, they, they have to admit that their ministry covers the gambit. To pinpoint it into one, it's impossible. God looks for servants. God calls servants. Then he places servants. I had no idea that God had the fast track for me. No clue. I served my time as youth pastor. Yeah, I served my time. <laughs> loved every minute of it. Associate pastor, loved every minute of it. But I always knew that there was going to be more. Uh -huh. yeah. I'm not trying to get us to understand. God didn't change and say, okay, now I got to find, now where's Moses going to fit in? Everything Moses did, this is what you got to understand. Everything that Moses did fit into God's plan. Right. We might look at it and say, what a failure. He went and hid himself in the desert. And that's exactly what Moses thought he was doing. But God said, no, 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 no. I had to take everything out of your life. I had to remove you from the palace for 40 years in order for you to finally be able to hear my voice. Right. You can, you're, you're no longer going to be influenced by the voice of the Pharaoh, nor are you going to be influenced by the voice of your mother. Now you're only going to be influenced by my voice. Right. And the only time it seems that God can get through to us is when we are in the desert and we cannot hear the voices of other people and other influences in our lives. So it wasn't a change in plans. It was God's plan all along. I love it how His plan isn't set in concrete. What, were I, what if I were to tell you, and would it make a difference if I were to tell you that your failures were in God's plan? That should make us rejoice to know that our failures didn't move us out of God's plan. Hello? Oh. I want to get to some of these questions. I'm running out of time. Let me ask you this. Have you ever experienced God calling you to a new endeavor or ministry when you have failed previously? Anybody?
Yeah. I'm going to say the first time that I was put on the piano to do music, it was terrible. Seriously. I knew three songs. It was terrible. And the next service, you know what? It wasn't much better. But it eventually got uh, a little bit better, at least, you know. <laughs> but failing was embarrassing, and yet the need was there. It didn't go away just because I was terrible. And so that was a lesson that I learned. But just because I failed at it didn't change the need at all. Right. Yeah. Right. This is this is this is a problem that we have. The problem that we have is this: we don't think we are qualified to do anything because we can't do it. What if I were to tell you I hate public speaking? I'm kind of in the wrong job for that. Right? A little bit. Well, that's why I got the key to church. Oh, no. <laughs> I wish this wasn't on. <laughs> Not many ministers love teeny tiny churches. Right? Come on. Nor do they ever intend. Let me go get the camera on this. They can still hear me. Nor mm -hmm. will they ever intend stay here. Come on. So what am I trying to get us to understand? When the need is there, sometimes just somebody having a desire, whether they're good at it or not, is important. I'd rather have somebody try something and fail at it than we can work on it than not have anybody there at all. Then the next question was, since there was only one person who responded to the original question, how did you respond? And I think we all figured that out right. on our own. How did it turn out? Obviously, we know how it turned out. Now, this is probably the most important part of the lesson. Is if we were to read into that story, and like we couldn't go into it, but we all do know the story well enough to know that Moses tried to disqualify himself uh -huh. on more than one occasion. He had 101 reasons why he couldn't do it. But all God was looking for was willingness to do it. Why? Because God supplies the qualifications. Not me. 
Not you, not us, but God supplies the qualifications. And it's when we put our lives into God's hands and say, all right, God, I can tell you 101 reasons why I can't do it. All he needs is one reason to do it, and that's our willingness to just give it a try. I, 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 it frustrates me as a pastor when there are things that need to go undone and people won't even try. have Sunday school classes that need to be taught and people won't even try to teach a Sunday school class because they don't think they can. Well, within yourself, you probably can't. But that's why you lay yourself aside. That's why Moses had to go to the desert. It took him 40 years to finally lay himself aside and to stop feeling sorry for himself. They finally created the atmosphere where God could actually talk to him. It took 40 years. Right. Now, finally. But you know what the magic number is? Let me point something out to you. You know why? Another reason why it took 40 years? Because when Moses went back, it was a new generation that didn't even remember what he had done 40 years ago. The Statue of Limitations. Moses who? Who? I, and I bet Aaron was like, who are you? We thought you were all dead. We thought you were dead. We held a funeral service for you. We thought you were gone. Gone. Some of us probably thinking, you know what? That'd be nice to just go away for 40 years and come back and nobody remember me. <laughs> But the funny thing is, you'll never forget yourself. Right. Uh, and you are the one that spends most of our time beating ourselves up. Right. Uh, Amen. So Moses rejected the vision. So let me ask another question. What is your greatest impediment the following God's call. Who I said these were great questions. Yes. I don't know if this is really an impediment, but I remember um, when I had um, serenity and I was on maternity leave and uh, thinking about going back to work and stuff, and I was so upset because I thought, I have these four beautiful daughters that I just really want to be a stay at home mom. Service to my family by not being able to stay at home with my children. And I was so upset. I was praying about it, and I'm like, God, why do I have to go back to work? Why can't I stay at home with my kids? This is what I really want to do. And God just spoke to me and said, because that's your mission field. It's, your, it's the people that you work with. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, guess I can't say no to that, you know. And, and, it made it easier to go back to work and stuff. I, it wasn't what I wanted. I wanted to be a stay-at-home mom and just stay home with my kids and, you know, nurture them and stuff. And I thought that that could possibly be against God's will, you know. But God was like, no, you're, you need to be out there with other people and witnessing to them and being an example to them. Mm -hmm. So that was, you know, it was kind of my will against what God wanted for me to do. Okay. So what is your greatest impediment to following God's call? Perception of yourself? And here's another question. Understanding of God's power. How about fear of rejection? Yes. Yep. Amen. Boy, yep. 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 Uh -huh. just throw the word fear in there and 
And that, that is the most popular answer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're free. Mm -hmm. Afraid of what? Let me ask the question. That was the most popular answer, so let's go with it. What are you afraid of? Failure. Failure? You're gonna fail unless you do it. Not doing it is failure. Right. Sure what other people think. Why? Being able to hold up your standards. You set a bar for yourself, and you're not able to reach that bar that you set. So, then the resounding response then is I do nothing. Because of fear, I do nothing. What does the Bible say about fear? God has not given us a spirit of fear. But of a... Go say that again. Sound. Who say that again. So let me point something out to you. If you show fear or function in fear, you do not have a sound mind. So then it's not fear, but it's a lack of a sound mind. God gives us the sound mind. It's not one I can give myself. So that means if we function out of fear or we do not function because of fear, then we need to take a closer look not at the fact that we're afraid, but at the fact is we don't have a sound mind in our relationship with God needs to be worked on. Right. For your information, if I was always concerned about what other people think, I would have never got up here. And if I ever cared about what people think, I would have stopped a long time ago. And if I care what people think, then the message would be watered down and it'll just tickle your ears and make you feel good. Right. No challenge. No thought provocation. Right. Nothing. And just tell you, get up here and tell you what you want to hear. Make you feel good about yourself. And then you go home and say, ah, I feel good about my sinning. It's not my job. My job is to push and compel you to do better. You need to do better for us to do better. That's my job. And if that means stirring things up. You know how many times people walk out of the church because they don't like what they hear? So that means if I want to keep the pews full, then I need to make everybody feel good about themselves. But then you want to know who walks out the door? The people who want to be pushed. Right. Yeah. The people who wants to be challenged. Right. 
That's the people who want to be questioned. Yes. Then those are the ones that walk out the door. So I realized I can't win either which way. So I just need to do the best that I can. Right. But if I ever functioned out of fear, who would be doing it? Folks, we're in the last days. There's no room for fear anymore. Fear is not of God. It drives me nuts when I hear people of God tell me they're afraid. So despite Moses' past failures and present lack of faith, this is your next answer, God persisted. So we finally get to the last point, or one of the last points, and finally, who are you after all? If, if, if I, who am I to tell the people who sent me? Tell them I am that I am sent me. Or sent you. Okay? Moses goes back after 40 years. And they're like, who are you? Who sent you here? The I am. The I am needs no introductions. The I am needs no pomp and circumstance. The I am said it. The I am meant it. The, you don't understand. The term I am. You have your Bible and you look at it. 